Well, good morning, everybody. How are we all doing? Good to see you this morning. Miserable as it is outside, there is warmth in our hearts because God is good. God has come to us and God has saved us so wonderfully. And if you don't know that here this morning, I do pray by the end of this service, you will know that, that God has died wonderfully for you and to save you from your sins. We just got a few notices this morning. Um, First of all, we've got our communion service this evening, which is a great opportunity for us to just remember everything that God has done in our lives, the wonderful way he saved us. So please do come and join us. That's tonight at six o'clock. Is that right? Yep. Awesome stuff. Fantastic. And also next week, if you want your friends to know this amazing joy that I pray that you have, we're having our evangelistic service next week. Um, It's going to be a great opportunity to invite friends along and to discover, um, for them to discover the amazing way in which Jesus has transformed their life. And the topic is going to be how to find God in a world that hurts you. How to find God in a world that hurts you. I don't know about you, but I definitely need to hear that as well. How to find God in a world that hurts you. Shall we stand together as we join and together for praise this morning? (coughs) I just want to read a few words of scripture before we start. These are just a few words from 1 Peter, which I think just puts everything into perspective in terms of what we're doing here this morning. We're coming to praise a God who chose to die for us. I know I've said that multiple times this morning, but it's so, so important that we grasped that. And Peter grasped that in these words when he said this, when they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray. But now you have returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. How amazing is that? How amazing is that? Lord, we just want to come before you this morning in gratitude for everything that you've done. In thanks for everything you've done for us. Lord, we just pray that any distractions that are going on for us, Lord, will be put to one side so we can focus on you. So that we can praise you and lift your name high in such a wonderful, wonderful way. Amen. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. What love could remember, no wrongs we have done. Our mission's all knowing, He counts not their son. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. Tender is calling us home. He welcomes the weakest, 
Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory. 
Lord Jesus. Death could not hold you. Veil tore before you. What can we do but simply sing of your goodness and live it out in our lives? How wonderful you are, Lord Jesus. Just want to invite you to just close your eyes now just for a few moments. And just in your, own, in your own words, just pray to God. Just thank him for all he's done. The, the way he's come into your life. The way he's changed you. Let's just pour out our praises to him. Let him know just how much we are grateful for all he's done. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for all you've done. Thank you, Lord Jesus.
and they hurled their insults at him. He did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Thank you, Lord. Amen. If you'd like to take your seats. Good morning, everyone. Oh, gosh, I got quite emotional at the end of that then. Ah, right, okay. Parable of the prodigal son. We looked at it last week, the first part. Uh, we're looking at it again uh, this week. A little bit more unconventionally this week, I think, than last week. Um, and so I just said parable of the prodigal son, didn't I? Ah, oh, that's my opening point this morning. My opening point this morning is last week, I called it the prodigal, prodigal of the lost sons. And I was going to say, can any of you remember why I said it was a bad idea to call it the prodigal, the, the, oh man, I think I must still be emotional, the, why it's a bad idea to call it the parable of the prodigal son. I don't know if you remember me explaining why I thought that was a bad idea. Uh, let me just go through the first three verses of chapter 15 and explain again why. So the, the parable of the lost sons is later on in chapter 15, but uh, it always helps when you contextualize what you're reading, okay? And it gives you more understanding and more insight and so on. So right at the beginning of this, this is the beginning of chapter 15 and verse 1. It says, now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. They are one grouping of people, right? The tax collectors and the sinners, the conventionally bad people of the day. Then verse 2, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they're another group in of people. These are conventionally the good people of the day, right? So you've got two groups of people. You've got the tax collectors and the sinners on the one hand, the bad people. You've got the Pharisees and the teachers of the law on the other hand, the good people, the religious people. Two groupings of people. And then it says, verse 3, then Jesus told them this parable. So he tells them the parable, first of all, of the lost sheep. Why? Because he wants to get across to people that God really cares about lost people and wants to seek and find them. Then he tells the parable of the lost coin. Why? Because he wants people to get across to people that God really cares about lost people and wants to seek and to find them. Then he tells this parable about two sons, both equally lost. And so if we were to call it the parable of the prodigal son, you would look with different eyes. You would be looking at it thinking, okay, I'm looking for one son. This parable is about one son, and he's prodigal. He's just wayward. It's not really what it's about. It's about two sons, both of whom were equally lost. Okay, right. Let's get into the parable again now. Uh, so what we're going to see this week is that these two sons are representative of two main groupings of people in this world. So Jesus is confronted with the tax collectors and the sinners. They're kind of the conventionally bad people, the liberals. And he's con confronted with the religious people, the conventionally good people, the one who keep moral standards and so on. Two main groupings of people. So that when you get the parable of the lost sons, two main groupings of people are represented in this incredibly clever story that Jesus tells. So verse 11 says, Jesus continued talking about another parable of lost people. There was a man who had two sons, two sons. Uh, the younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them at that point. Now, we, we talked about this last week. He went off, this younger son, went wild, had this big blowout, did some crazy stuff, got stone broke, got to an end of himself, was truly repentant, went back to the father, and then we saw last week, and this was the focus of last week, 
which I think is a beautiful focus, is the grace of the Father representing the grace of God to us. And we saw in that that God's grace is just incredible in his incredible love that we saw in the Father, in his in, uh, extravagant generosity that we saw in the Father, and also this almost shocking joy that the Father has over his Son. And we saw that that grace continues to apply to us as believers, and we can forget that. We come to the Father by grace, but we sometimes continue by efforts and works and what we think we have to earn, and we forget that God still loves us and still gives us everything and still delights over us and that nothing cancels grace out. Nothing you can do, no matter how you step up, st step up in your life, nothing cancels grace. We saw that last week. So beautiful story of the son coming back and his father just receiving him with amazing grace and then throwing this incredible party that he doesn't deserve, but it's grace, right? So he throws this party for his son and then the elder brother comes home, not happy. So this is where we pick it up and he's going to be the focus of today's message, guys, the elder brother. Verse 28. So the older brother became angry, and he refused to go in. Uh, so his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years, I've been slaving for you, and I've never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, father says, you are always with me and everything I have is yours, but we have to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So like I said, this parable is kind of representative of the two main types of people in this world. You will fit in one of these categories, maybe loosely, and of course there's a spectrum within these categories, and there's crossover, but you could really say that generally speaking, most people fit into these main categories that Jesus is telling through this story in this world. So first of all, you've got the younger brother, right? He's representative of those people who want to be free to live their lives from God without rules. Uh, they, they're the liberals, if you like, the irreligious people in the world. If they had a motto, the motto would probably be live, laugh, love, and don't tell me what to do. If they were to say what the problem in the world is today, the problem in the world today is the religious people, the bigots, the narrow-minded people, those who are intolerant. And we need to shout loudly and get them cancelled. They're one grouping loosely of people in the world today who want to be free of standards, right? And then you get the other grouping of people represented by the elder brother who want to live by standards, who want to live by rules, who want to keep up appearances and sometimes are religious as well. So the problem in the world, as far as they're concerned, are those people who have abandoned all standards. They live as they please. They're ruining society because there's no absolutes anymore. They've abandoned God's ways. They're morally debauched. They're woke, infested liberals. And they want God to judge them now. Now, they're possibly the two main groupings of people in the world. I don't know where you think that you fit this morning. I would guess more in the, we want to live by standards and rules and religion, more in that kind of category. But what we'll see in this parable, right? We'll see in this parable that there's one person that's conventionally bad and the other is conventionally good, but both are alienated from the Father. Both the irreligious and the religious are lost. Both paths in their life are dead ends. Both disgrace the Father. Both the religious and the irreligious approaches to life lead to dissatisfaction. Both of them are offered undeserved grace by the Father. And then the shock at the end of this parable is the prostitute-loving one is the one who is in the celebration of the Father at the very end while the moralistic one is outside 
Again, a representation right at the end of heaven, which would have shocked his listeners, which would have really shocked the religious people of the day. Right, so I guess what I want to get across this morning is, is this. If we fit into one of those two categories, which do we fit into more? And you may think, I don't fit into either of those. But here's the danger, I believe, for us as Christians. The danger is we can begin to slip into the moralistic, religious type of person, and our lives start to fall apart as a result of that. Just to ask a question to begin with, where are you in your Christian life at this moment in time? Do you feel that you are maybe just about treading water in your Christian life? Do you feel maybe that you, you're coming along to church, you're keeping it going, but it's a real drudgery to you? It's not enjoyable anymore. It used to be, but now you do it because you feel you should do it, but really, really maybe you would prefer to be doing something else, but you're keeping it going because you know it's the right thing. If you've got to that point in your Christian life, and if it's not thrilling you like it used to, I would imagine you slipped into becoming more like this elder brother, and I'll show you how in a minute. You may have sympathy for the elder brother. You may have listened to this and thought, this just seems unfair because the elder brother is the one who's kind of been the good son, and the bad son seems to be treated even better than that, and it doesn't seem fair. You can, you can understand why he's angry. But let's look at the text again, right? Let's go into it in a bit more detail. Verse 28, the older brother became angry, it says, okay? And he refused to go in, so his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. You never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes come home, you kill the fattened calf for him. He's angry with his father. The father comes out and pleads with him. He embarrasses the father in front of everybody, in front of the guests, because he's shouting at his father, he's angry with him. He says that everything he's done up until this point for his father is slaving away for him. He hasn't done it because he's loved his dad. He hasn't done it because he's loved the work. He's done it out of a sense of duty for reward, so it's like a slavery for him. And then he wants to run down the son, the other son. He's not happy that his father's happy. He sees this as a rival now to his status in the family, and he's really, really angry. You can kind of imagine the scene, can't you? Where the son is outside and someone tells the father, your elder son, he's really, really angry with what you've done. The father goes out and he's like, Dad, I can't believe you're doing this. What are you doing? And then the father is pleading with, please, son, I want you to come in as well. You are equally welcome to come in with, with my son, with, with, with your brother. It's amazing what's happened, isn't it? Isn't it amazing? I can't believe it, Dad. Oh, but all these years, over the past year or whatever it is, he's been a disgrace to the family. He's done some shocking stuff. I've been slaving away for you all my life. Do you think I've enjoyed that? Slaving away from you. What do I get? What do I get out of it, Dad? Nothing. You give me nothing. I'm done with you, Dad. But son, but son, you know I've always loved you exactly the same. I just don't understand why you're feeling this way. Dad, that son, a prostitute-loving son, you're doing that for him? Forget it. And he embarrasses his father in front of everyone. That's the son, that's the religious person that we're talking about here. Before we move on to that, to see if there's any of that religious spirit in us, um, it's important for me to get across that this parable tells us as well, doesn't it, that you can't get into heaven by being good enough and by being religious enough. And so entrance into this celebration at the end was purely by grace, right? You just get invited in. The son, the elder son, didn't want to go in. I want to earn my way in, he said. Now, you may be here today, and you may be thinking, I don't want you to tell me that God forgives me. I don't want you to tell me that there's grace for me. I don't think I need it. I want God to give me what I deserve. And you may think that your self-righteousness is good enough. But if God was to give you what you deserve, it won't be heaven. You may be one of the more conventionally good people in this world as opposed to the conventionally bad people in this world, for sure. 
But then Jesus says, you know, there's no one who does good. No one who is good by God's standards. We all fall short. You need God's grace. But also, like I said earlier, we've got we to ask ourselves as well as believers, have we fallen into the trap of becoming too religious, maybe? And maybe that's affecting your Christian life right now. Did you know, fun fact, that in the first century, Romans, the Romans thought the Christians were atheists? I don't know if you knew that. Because imagine how the conversation would go. Oh, so uh, what God do you worship then? Jesus Christ. Oh, okay. Unusual. That guy who was taken and crucified, yeah, and died in shame and embarrassment. Yes, that one. Okay. So uh, wh where's your temple? Oh, we don't have a temple. Oh, okay. Um, what, what, what sort of priests do you have? Oh, we, we don't have those either. Huh? So, you know, when you do your sacrifices and stuff to your God, Jesus, if you haven't got priests, who does the sacrifices? Oh, we don't have sacrifices. You don't have sacrifices. That's not a religion. You're not worshiping God. No temple, no priests, no sacrifices. So they actually thought they were atheists in the day. Today... If you were to say to someone outside of church, what do you think of Christians? Oh, they're re religious. They follow all these kind of moral standards. They think they're better than everyone else. That's probably how they see a lot of Christianity today. I wonder whether we sometimes look too religious to the world. But in the first century, they thought they were atheists. Now, Christianity, all right, um, if, you, if you read Tim Keller, he's just so good on this and showing the similarities between even the religious person and the younger brother in terms of what they wanted to get out of this situation. So listen to how Tim Keller puts it. He says, neither son, here we are, neither son truly wanted the father and loved him for himself. They both used the father to achieve their own self-centered ends. Rather than serving him out of joy and love, uh, one by wanting what the father had for self-pleasure, the other by making the father a debtor. One rebelled by breaking the rules, the other by keeping them. Neither humbly loved and served the father because they wanted to, but because they had an agenda. You see, religious people obey God to get things. They don't obey God to get God himself in order to resemble him, love him, know him, and delight in him. There's the key phrase. Religious people Obey God to get things, not to get God. What do religious people hope that they will get out of obeying God? Generally, religious people hope to get reward, and they hope to get admiration from people. That's the religious spirit that we're going to be looking out for today, is that you can slip into wanting to do things for reward and wanting to do things to impress people to get their admiration or adoration. Let me give you an example. It's another kind of a parable type story, but based on a true story about a man called Salieri. Any of you heard of a composer, an Italian composer called Salieri? Some of you maybe have. Have any of you heard of another composer called Mozart? You've obviously heard of Mozart, right? One of the greatest composers who's ever lived. Okay, now they had a rivalry, Salieri and Mozart. Uh, so the rumor goes that in the 18th century, Salieri poisoned Mozart out of jealousy, and that led to Mozart's very young, premature death. It's unlikely that that's true, but what is true is Salieri was very, very jealous of the prodigious talent and fame that Mozart was getting. So this man, Peter Schaeffer, wrote a play called Amadeus, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. He writes this play, Amadeus, about this rivalry between Salieri and Mozart. Right, this is what Salieri prays in this play as a young man or as a young boy. He says this to God. Lord, make me a great composer. Let me celebrate your glory through music and be celebrated myself. Make me famous through the world, dear God. Make me immortal. And after I die, let people speak my name forever with love for what I wrote. In return, I vow I will give you my chastity, my industry, my deepest humility every hour of my life. And I will help my fellow man all I can. Amen and amen. 
And then what he does, Salieri, he, he, he's true to his word. So he feels he's made a bargain with God now, a deal with God. And he lives this really, really good, chaste, holy life. He's helping the poor and feeding the poor. He's teaching other musicians for free. He actually taught Mozart. He taught Beethoven. He taught Franz Liszt, another quite famous composers. He was so influential in so many people's lives, okay? But then Mozart came along. And Mozart was uber talented, so talented. And everyone could see how incredibly talented he was as a musician and a composer. And so Salieri looked at his life and thought, he's obviously got that talent from God, but he's such a bad person. Mozart was the opposite of being chaste and being moral. He was kind of putting it out there and living this really bad lifestyle. And so Salieri looked at that and thought, this just isn't fair. I've done all of this. I've worked so hard for God. I've kept my side of the bargain. He has let me down. He's betrayed me. And this person who doesn't deserve it is getting all the reward and all the admiration. And then this is what he says. He says, it was incomprehensible, says Salieri. Here I was denying all my natural lust in order to deserve God's gift. And there was Mozart indulging his in all directions, even though engaged to be married, and no rebuke at all. And then he goes on to say to God, from now on, we are enemies, you and I. And then for the rest of the play, he works to destroy Mozart. That's the religious spirit. It's so much like the elder brother in the prodigal son, isn't it? Done all this, I've been slaving, kept my side of the bargain, and then you love this person who doesn't deserve to be loved. Listen again to how Tim Keller puts this. I'm not sure if this is on the screen or not. He says this, Elder brothers may do good to others, but not out of delight in the deeds themselves or for the love of people or for the pleasure of God. They're not really feeding the hungry and clothing the poor. They're feeding and clothing themselves. I think that's so spot on. So you can get someone who is feeding and clothing the poor, but if their spirit is wrong, if they've got a religious spirit, if they're doing things because they want reward and they're doing things because they want admiration, they're not feeding and clothing the poor, they're feeding and clothing themselves. That's the religious spirit. Okay, now I know this might sound harsh, but I reckon that lots of us today have something of the religious spirit in us, and that's what's damaging our Christian lives. So for the rest of the message, this is going to be a little bit diagnostic, and then for my last message on the prodigal son, we're really going to focus on what the Christian life truly is all about. But I'm going to ask you four questions now, and I'm going to ask you if this is true of you. And if these questions are true of you to some extent, it may be that you have something of the religious spirit of the elder brother that's crept in. This desire to live for God, to, for reward and for admiration from others. First question, are you jealous and judgmental? Are you jealous and judgmental? You know, the elder brother is partly angry because he sees the goodness of the father to this son. The son has been completely transformed. He's repentant. He's a new person. He's transformed by the love of the Father, and now he has a rival. And he doesn't like the fact that he has this rival, and his superiority and his self-worth are under threat, and he becomes very, very angry and jealous. Is that spirit sometimes in you? Do you ever feel that if someone is saying to you, oh, he's great, isn't he? Do you kind of want to say, mm, yeah? But have you seen his latest post on Facebook? He loves himself, really. I mean, I don't want to kind of put him down or anything, but I, yeah, I'm not so sure. Have you ever felt you wanted to say that? Or have you actually said something like that? Or maybe, ah, oh, she's incredible, and you really want to say things, but something, someone inside is saying to you, like, but what about me? So special about her. Why, why are they noticing her and not me? Even to the point of, like, uh, judging between churches and which churches are better. So Olivia um, was with us uh, yesterday for a few hours. She slept overnight. I dropped her off at the train station this morning. 
in the car driving along. So Liv, tell me about, I won't say what it was. I asked her about a certain aspect of life in Christchurch. And she was saying, oh yeah, they do this. And she, but you know, they, they do this really, really well. And I've experienced something I haven't really experienced in Bagland. They do, we don't do it so well in Bagland. They do it so, so well. I felt like saying, get out. <laughs> they, can, <laughs> they can have you in Newport as far as I'm concerned. But that was sort of in me, you know, there's that sense, oh, why are they better than us? Is it me? Is it I'm failing in some way? And it's that comparative spirit, isn't it, which makes us jealous and sometimes judgmental. If you find that's in you, if you find that is in you to a great extent, maybe. Maybe you've got something of the religious spirit in you, the elder brother spirit. Uh, second question, uh, do you find that the Christian life is drudgery? This is a big one. This is a big one. So in verse 29 we read, didn't we, the elder brother says that, I've been slaving for you all these years. In all intents and purposes, people looking on at that situation would be thinking, gosh, that elder brother is lovely. He does so many great things for the family. He goes to church every week. He's such a, an ideal, perfect son. But then he says, I've been slaving for you. He's not enjoyed a minute of it. He's seen it as slavery, a drudgery, but it's a means to an end, isn't it? I do it for reward. I do it for admiration. I don't enjoy it. Is that how it's become for you in the Christian life? Is it a drudgery? You turn up to church, maybe you're praying still, but you don't enjoy prayer anymore. Maybe you're reading the Bible still, but you don't enjoy reading the Bible anymore. Maybe secretly you're thinking, I actually would want to live like the world. That seems like better fun. And you know, there have been really high profile instances, haven't there, of people who on the outside have lived religious life, but on the inside have been living very, very different secret lives because the life has become a drudgery for them and they still want joy and they look for it in having a blowout in some area of their life. So if your Christian life has become a drudgery, this is one of the main points, I think, then I would imagine that maybe something of the religious spirit the elder brother spirit has crept back in to the way in which you live your Christian life. Third question, uh, do you get angry with God or yourself sometimes? You see, when you make a bargain with God subconsciously and you do things for reward, then you're not serving God because you love him, because you're serving God because you want to get stuff out of this life, right? Right? And then when things go bad for you, when things go wrong, and your formula breaks down, then your response can be, this is not fair. I'm doing this for you, God. I'm living this way, and it seems so unjust that my life has just gone pear-shaped now. And if you don't get angry with God, you may get angry with yourself, because then you may think, Maybe God's judging me. Maybe because I'm not very good. Maybe because I haven't lived the life I should have been living. Maybe God is judging me, and maybe this is just what I, I deserve. Uh, has that ever happened to you? Or is that happening to you where you're getting angry with life? It's not working out, and you're doing the right things, but it's still not great. And so rather than living the Christian life because you love it, you're living the Christian life for reward, and it's not working out. That's the elder brother spirit. Fourth question, um, do you lack assurance? Do you lack assurance in your faith? You see, if you're doing things for reward, then you're never going to know whether you're good enough or not. And that can lead you to thinking, I just don't know if when God looks at me, he can love me for who I am. And I don't know whether I am a Christian. I don't know if I'm going to get to heaven. And so if we do things for reward or for admiration or whatever it is, then sometimes we can lack assurance as well. Do you lack assurance that God loves you absolutely, totally because of his grace? Well, maybe if that's you this morning, maybe, like I said, you've got something of the religious spirit. And maybe we need to listen to this verse. So I want to round up with this verse this morning. This is Revelation chapter 2 and verses 4 to 5. This is a letter that Jesus wrote to a church that were doing so many great things. So on the face of it, they were obedient. On the face of it, they were great at spotting error and false doctrine and heresy. And they were doing lots of things in the community. So, so Jesus was saying, great, tick, 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 tick for so many things. But then he says this. He says, yet I hold this against you. It's one thing 
But it's the big thing. It's foundational. It undergirds everything in the Christian life. He says this, you have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. So here's the question, guys. Have you forsaken the love that you had at first? What, what love are we talking about? What does it mean by at first? You know when you became a Christian? What was the love that you had at first? Let me remind you, if you can't remember, it would have been something like this. You would have been amazed at the love of God for you. It would have blown you away. That revelation that Jesus Christ has died on the cross for you, even though you were a sinner, you felt your sin for the first time. You felt how rubbish you were. You felt how undeserving you were of anything from God. You thought, maybe I deserve hell. But Jesus Christ, the Son of God, went through all of that for me. You felt the incredible love of God for the first time. And your response to that was, God, I love you. You are absolutely amazing. There's nobody like you. And what did that result in then? It resulted in you saying, I want to live for you now, God. I want to read the Bible. Let me find out what it's all about. Oh, this is exciting. I love reading the Bible. And you know, I want to start changing. My life before wasn't right. Now I'm loving the fact that I'm living for God. I feel alive. I feel I've got purpose. I feel I've got meaning. I'm stopping doing some of the stuff that I was doing before. It was ruining my life. And now I'm living the right way. I love it. The, the love you had at first was God loved you. And you wallowed in that love. And as a result of that, you loved him back. You loved keeping the commands because you loved them. You loved reading his word. You loved other people. It's love. It's simply that it's love that's the key to breaking this religious spirit. So guys, if your life feels like I feel too jealous a lot of the time, I feel angry with God a lot of the time, I feel like this is a judgery a lot of the time, I feel I lack assurance a lot of the time, I would imagine it's because you've forsaken your first love. You just need to come back to that, guys. Wallow in what God has done for you. Just spend time. So this is what we're going to do in the next message. We're going to be thinking about what has God done for us? How much has he loved us? We're going to think about how we're going to love him back. And we're going to think about actually all his ways are amazing. We don't need to have a secret life. We don't need to have this urge inside to want to find joy outside of the faith because we can find it in living for God. It's loving God. It's loving his ways and loving others. So we pray together. Lord God, um, uh, thank you for speaking to us. I hope you have spoken to us this morning, God. And if there's developed in us a religious spirit where we're doing stuff for all the wrong reason and we're just, we've not been enjoying the Christian life for a long, long time, and maybe we've become like the elder brother, doing, just doing it for reward and admiration and we've developed a religious spirit. God, will you help us to just get back to appreciating again, going over again, how much you love us, how incredible your grace is to us, and being blown away by that. And then as a result of that, just thinking, I love you, God. That's why I want to live this Christian life, because I love you. And seeing your ways, Lord, as being so beautiful, so good, so enjoyable, that we love them all over again. And seeing your word as something that we love to read because it changes us. And seeing prayer as something that we love to do. Please take away uh, the, se the sense that we have that we have to do these things. And transform us into an attitude where we get to do these things. Where we're privileged to do these things again, God. Please restore to us the joy of our salvation. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Shall we stand together and respond?
We just want to come to you, Lord, and find that first love. Thank you, Lord. Do you let us come back? Let's sing it one more time. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for that thing I've made. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus.
you so much for all you've done. Lord, you are so wonderful. We want to come back to your wonderful love. We don't want to, we don't want to leave ourselves in that place. We want to lift our voices and sing to you, not because we have to, but because you are worthy of it all. Lord, we pray that we'll do that this morning, that we'll do that with our lives. We'll give you the highest praise above all. We'll give you the glory that is due your name. Lord, we give you the highest praise. We give you the
deserves the highest praise. Lord, if we've, if we've chosen to go away to squander all you've given us, like the younger son, we come back now saying we're sorry. And if like the older son, we've been slaving away, not doing it out of joy, but doing it out of duty, we want to come back to you and we want to say sorry. Because you are worthy of it all. We come back humbly and we say we're sorry. And we want to rediscover that first love. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. We're going to serve teas and coffees now. Please do come and speak to anyone if you've been touched by what's been shared this morning and you want to speak with someone some more. Um, don't leave with that thought still in your head. Have a good afternoon, guys. God bless.